uh, it's a pleasure to have you here in uh, the European Parliament. Uh, dear friends, my problem being the last speaker is that I actually don't have much to add to what has been said before. And uh, more so because I, I, I can't pretend to be an expert on, on, on Central Asia. I'm not. So I'm not going to pretend uh, to be that. Uh, I believe that, that uh, both what I heard from uh, what Jelko said and what Marco said uh, is our current thinking on, on, on Central Asia. And, and the, the only personal element, well, I could add a few uh, ones, but one is that I have flown over uh, that region by day several times, uh, or, or else in, in midsummer when, when it's, it's day almost 24 hours for, out of 24. And, and even then, while flying, you realize how huge, how huge this territory is, and how it, it. I don't want to sound disrespectful, but how relatively empty it is, which means that when you fly over it and, and you look down and, and you you see these beautiful landscapes, you can only wonder what's going on there. Uh, you realize that we probably have no idea or no exact idea. <laughs> Anything could, could be happening or not at all. And you also realize what immense challenges uh, any infrastructure is. To provide roads, utilities for a, popu a, a sparsely uh, spread population over these huge territories implies incredible investments. Uh, and, and we know that uh, they have a, a, a lot of raw materials. And, and, and so there, there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenges, uh, challenges in the t purely territorial sense of the word. And I believe that, indeed, there are many reasons why uh, we should pay more attention to what's going on. Uh, and engage. I, I believe Marcus is, is completely right. Over the years, we have tried uh, with the European Union to um, to isolate some countries because we deeply disapproved of what was going on there. And I'm sorry to say, it has never worked. In, in it hasn't worked vis-à-vis vis -vis Belarus. It, it has never worked. So we need to do something else. And, and, and probably engaging while remaining, of course, critical uh, and very watchful is probably a better way than turning away from uh, a region or a country because we feel we can't possibly approve or even appear to be approving or to be indifferent to what's going on there. And, uh, I believe it in exchange with you to, to hear what your views are on, on, on the subject uh, would be uh, very useful. Apart from that, I would like to congratulate Liberal International on organizing this conference on this team. Thank you. Thank you. According to Sarah Palin, the fact that you flew over Central Asia will make you an expert, I think. Because if she views from Alaska, Russia, she says she's an expert. So you're an expert. Thank you very much Bye, for your contribution. Yeah, that, that's not uh, maybe a compliment, it's, it's but <laughs> it's only a joke. <laughs> so I would like to know who in the public uh, is ready to ask questions or make statements on the policy towards Central Asia, democracy, trade, how to deal with those countries. Who may I give the floor from the side of the audience? If, yes, please, could you state your name and maybe your party and ask a question? Um, my name is uh, Charlotte Trickman. <clears throat> I'm a stagiaire for Aldi and I was just wondering uh, what your position was on the PCA agreement with uh, Turkmenistan and uh, the issue now, whether it should be ratified on the part of the European Union or not, and why that would be the case. Thank you. Maybe 
Yelko Anami on the PCA agreement? Um, uh, we discussed this in the Foreign Affairs Committee, <coughs> and I believe there's a majority uh, for ratifying. Isn't that correct? Uh, but Yelko will be able to <laughs> add a few more things on the subject. As Anami said before, yes, we failed many times. But if we want to create better opportunities for the future, we need to provide positive vibrations. We need to support cooperation between EU on one hand and every and each individual country in a region. As soon as one country is having this kind of uh, agreement, there is a question in the direct neighborhood why they have and we don't. And this is creating a dynamism which can uh, create better opportunities to speed up the development process. Uh, what I want to say is, and what I'm going to say is my personal position. It's not just about 27 individual states, members of European Union. We have to create our common policy. That's why we need to invest much more, first of all, to know more about these countries and to develop a long-term strategy. And on the other hand, again, we need partners. I believe that Turkey is an excellent partner. There are many colleagues who have reservations concerning the democracy in Turkey. But comparing Turkey with these countries and observing Turkey from these countries, it is not a country with a red flag. It is a country with a blue European flag, with yellow stars. It is, uh, how can I say, a pet finder towards European Union observing from these countries. That's why we together, 27 and Turkey, we could be much more persuasive, much more eloquent, much faster and much more productive. That's why uh, I believe that we need to strengthen our coordination vis-a-vis -vis these countries and these economies. Thank you. Markus. I, I would like to just uh, like to make a remark on, on Turkmenistan because that uh, your question was on Turkmenistan. You should be aware that Turkmenistan takes no foreign investment except for from one country, and that is China. And China is investing in uh, the oil and gas industry in Turkmenistan, and we have interests there. So we should be very much into finding ways of getting into Turkmenistan and trying to be engaged with them in the oil and gas industry and in other possibilities. But we have to, uh, I think we really have to, to push for that. It is in our interest to have relations and to, to open up possibilities with Turkmenistan. Others who have questions? Uh, Robert Brown and then you. Robert. Um, Robert with Thorpe Brown, uh, Liberal Democrats. Um, I actually have landed in the area, but not in all of the countries, which is a great regret. Um, but I have been to Azerbaijan and to Kazakhstan um, on more than one occasion. The, I think the, there are various issues that come out of this. Firstly, I would hope that the, it might be possible for the Secretariat to publish or to distribute a copy of Nick Clegg's uh, OSCE speech last week. I thought that was going to happen, and I, I would welcome it if the Secretariat could do so. Um, because it was important, because it did stress the fact that uh, no region of the world is exempt from human rights obligations, especially signatories to OSCE. So that is one issue I'd like to take up. Role of Russia and China is important. Russia obviously would like to recreate, at least on an economic level and a semi-political level, uh, the former Soviet Union. Um, and so therefore, a lot of its it regards a lot of these countries as very much its backyard, although luckily recently Medvedev did allow that um, the overflight rights should continue for the case of Afghanistan. Um, there are natural cultural similarities. They've been part of the Soviet Union, therefore they're used to one-man rule from the top, and democracy is uh, guided democracy at best. 
Um, and I think this is an area where we liberals must be trying in fairly infertile ground to sow liberalism, though I realize that's the subject of our second, uh, our second session. The next thing that is important, I take very much on board what was said about Turkey. The first uh, few times that I went to the area, I was always in, uh, accompanied by a, a gentleman who is actually now a Turkish MP, um, because there was very much an affinity in the early 90s uh, between Turkey, who thought this was their backyard, Turkic-speaking peoples, they could try and, and penetrate. In fact, the Turks didn't do it terribly well. Um, and they didn't make the penetration, and they lost patience rather too quickly. And I don't think they, they got much further than Azerbaijan in terms of pe uh, economic penetration. But I think that perhaps we could go into partnership with them, because if, on if only they speak the Turkic languages. Um, but it, it wasn't successful 20 years ago, and I'm not convinced um, that that is the route, though I think it is well one worth exploring. Um, I'm not sure what the latest situation about the Caspian pipeline was. Um, I was very much involved with Gazprom for many years, and Gazprom had the habit of buying um, gas from the, of Turkmenistan and flogging it into, uh, for much less than the rates it was able to flog it on for. And it acted as it used its uh, Gazprom pipelines as um, a way of making extra money, and I think the Turkmen have got pretty fed up with that. That is why they were looking for extra routes. Meanwhile, the Russians, of course, try to frustrate this as much as possible, and the Chinese have their little game going, whereby they are doing all the investment to try and get the, the pipelines going through very difficult territory to uh, get the gas and the oil into China. So just a little few observations. I now would like to give the floor to a friend from Sweden, please. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm very happy that we are having this seminar on a very important region that we have been not, I don't want to say, I want to be harsh and say neglecting, but uh, we have not been discussing it as much as we actually need. Um, as I see it is that uh, maybe we tend in, uh, in, within the European countries or in the Western world to care more about the economic uh, prospects of a region rather than the humans of the region, uh, how they are doing and uh, the political situation there, democracy, human rights, liberalism, uh, liberties, uh, and so on. Uh, so that's why I welcome this seminar very much and that we are actually taking this time and all of us coming here. Um, I, my question for you is how could because, uh, how could the EU or the European Parliament coordinate with the national parliaments so we have a coherent policy towards that, at least from a liberal perspective? What do you see? Where are, where are the arenas where we could corp uh, cooperate between the national governments and the European Parliament? Thank you very much. Yelko or Anami or both? The <coughs> That, that, of course, is, is a, a huge uh, question and an important issue. Uh, you, you probably know that uh, several times per year uh, we do have uh, joint meetings of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament and uh, uh, delegations of the Foreign Affairs Committees of the Parliaments of the Member States. And... Uh, Generally, we try to to um, to select a topic that might be of interest for for all of the the participants. And uh, uh, for instance, the, the last one uh, was about uh, the new <coughs> strategic concept of NATO, and we had uh, the NATO Secretary General uh, appearing before uh, the the whole audience. So that that would be a forum. Uh, a general parliamentary forum where uh, we, we could uh, put such a, a topic on, uh, on the agenda uh, about coordinating initiatives is even more difficult because then you need to be fully informed of what everybody does uh, and that, that's no, no easy task. So apart from that, uh, Again, when we consider Europe and European parliaments, uh, 
we could contemplate to put a subject uh, on the agenda of uh, either the next TLDR Congress, when we have a meeting of uh, MEPs and MPs uh, who are present, uh, that's a possibility, or uh, another uh, specific format, but uh, for the next few months, I must say that, that our agendas are, are so full that I, I don't very well see where we could insert one more uh, meeting. And of course, what is always possible is uh, by way of, uh, of uh, electronic media, uh, communicate with one another and uh, inform one another on what's going on. <laughs>